Okay, so it is Wednesday afternoon. It's about uh, 1.30. Uh, I almost forgot that I had to record an astronomy lecture today. I was busy with administrative stuff all morning. So uh, I'm going to try to get this done in maybe 45 minutes or so. This might be a little bit longer than the past few lectures because uh, I'm going to try to talk about asteroids and comets and um, all the kind of leftover junk of the solar system all in one lecture. And then, uh, then we can move on and talk about the sun later on this week. Um, first thing to notice when we look at the solar system, and we've seen this now from the time we looked at Mercury and Mars, to the time we looked at the moons of uh, Jupiter to Pluto and Charon, is that stuff is covered in craters. Uh, and that every one of those craters is a record of an impact that happened between one astronomical body and another. Here's some moons of Saturn, I believe. Uh, here is, uh, that looks like Mercury, um, covered in craters. Um, here is uh, the Earth with a big crater um, in it. Uh, I actually went on a cross-country trip over the summer. My daughter moved to Arizona, and we drove right nearby um, this place in Arizona, which is called Meteor Crater, Arizona. But it turns out it's on private land, and they wanted to charge like an outrageous amount of money, like $30, um, to park and just go walk to the edge of it and look at it. I'm like, I'm not paying $120 for my whole family to go look at this hole in the ground. So we didn't go, uh, which sucks because I always kind of wanted to see it because it's one of the biggest... Um, uh, and most recent craters uh, that you can see on the surface of the earth. But my the fact that I'm uh, kind of cheap uh, outweighed the, uh, the desire to go drive up to the edge of this crater. But this is a crater in Arizona. It's um, about a kilometer or so across, I think. Um, and it is evidence that the earth is occasionally impacted by comets, asteroids, meteoroids, things from space. But we don't see very many on the earth. Um, here's another one. This one, I think, is in Africa, which has been overgrown by uh, trees and foliage, but you can see that it looks too, not too different from craters on the moon. Um, here is a impact crater, I think this is up in Canada, uh, that has been gradually eroded away by time. And this picture is I guess, um, a clue to why we don't see many craters on the Earth. It's not that the Earth isn't hit by as much stuff as, say, the Moon or Mercury is hit by. It's that the Earth has processes that over time tend to erase craters. We have wind, we have rain, we have plate tectonics, we have volcanoes. So the surface of the Earth is constantly being shaped by forces that over time, over say a couple million years, will erode a crater like the one that looks like Meteor Crater in Arizona into something that's only noticeable from maybe a satellite photograph. Here are two craters that were actually filled up by water. So now they're just perfectly round lakes that um, if you weren't a geologist, you might not think to investigate the possibility that these are actually impact craters. Uh, here's one that's been very eroded away and filled in. Um, by water to the point where you might not even suspect that that is an impact crater. Um, here's one up uh, in northern Canada that's been basically filled in with a glacier. Um, and that ice outlines the original boundary of that impact crater. So the Earth does get hit by stuff in space, but that evidence is gradually erased over time. There's another reason that we don't see as many impact craters on Earth, especially small ones, is because we have an atmosphere. And objects like Venus, Earth, Titan, a lot of those smaller objects are going to burn up in the atmosphere or uh, uh, kind of evaporate before they hit the ground or even explode before they hit the ground. So our atmosphere protects us somewhat from uh, impacts from space. And the other thing is we have an ocean. And two thirds to three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water. So some of the things that would land on the Earth just land in the water and they don't leave a crater. Or if they do, they leave a crater at the bottom of the sea that we can't um, see. So the first thing, one of the first things I wanna do is a little vocabulary to, to clear up the difference between these three terms. Um, and that's meteoroid, meteorite, and meteor. Um, if you've ever wondered why the word meteor, which is a rock that falls from space, uh, is shares the same root 
as the word meteorology, which is about the weather, it's because meteors, which is just a little flash of light you see in the sky, what we sometimes call a shooting star or a falling star, they're very fast, they zip across the sky. Sometimes it can be very bright, as bright as the planet Jupiter or the planet Venus in the sky. Sometimes you can just barely see them. But they were thought by the ancient, say, ancient Greeks, which is where we get our, our, a lot of our etymologies from ancient, ancient Greek, ancient Roman um, languages. They were thought to be things that happened in the air, like lightning, right? Lightning is something that happens in the air. Meteors were thought to be little, um, little bursts of light, little flames that happen in the atmosphere. And so the root for meteorology, which is the study of the atmosphere, is also the root for the word meteor, which is just like a little, thought to be just a little flame in the atmosphere. Now, a meteor is something that happens in the atmosphere, right? But it's something that happens in the atmosphere when a rock from space called a meteoroid, burns up in the Earth's atmosphere, heats up to the point where it glows. You see the little flash of light as it burns up in the atmosphere. That little flash of light is the meteor, the falling star or shooting star. If the meteoroid doesn't burn up all the way in the process of being a meteor and makes it all the way to the ground and hits the ground and you go pick it up off the ground, that object you picked off the ground is now a rock. It's a mineral on the Earth's surface, and that is called a meteorite. Okay, so um, a meteorite is something you pick up off the ground. A meteor is something you see in the sky, and a meteoroid is a rock floating around in space that may or may not someday hit the Earth. Uh, a meteoroid is just a small asteroid. There's no hard dividing line between what we call an asteroid and well there probably is an arbitrary dividing line like if it's bigger than 10 miles we call it or bigger than a mile we call it a, a meteor a meteoroid and if it's no other way around if it's smaller than a mile we call it a meteoroid it's bigger than a mile i don't know what the dividing line is it's arbitrary there are a bunch of rocks floating around in space right some of them are big some of them are small this is a map showing uh, a region of our solar system that has a lot of these space rocks which we call asteroids, we call the small one meteoroids. This is the famous asteroid belt, which exists in our solar system between the orbits of Earth and the orbit of, um, sorry, between the orbit of Mars and the orbit of Jupiter, okay? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, asteroid belt, Jupiter. One of the things that you can see by looking at the inner solar system is it goes Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and there's kind of a big gap before you get to Jupiter. And the asteroid belt kind of lives right in that gap where you might expect if there was a pattern, you'd find a planet there. And it may be that a planet was forming there four and a half, five billion years ago, and their large impact broke up that planet too fast for the particles to ever coalesce back together again in that debris became the asteroid belt. Pictures of the asteroid belt like this give you a misconception of how dense the asteroid belt really is because the pixels in the picture are way bigger than the actual objects that make up the meteors and, and meteoroids and asteroids. Um, we have sent a dozen spacecraft um, to the outer solar system. Voyager Pioneer, 10 and 11, Voyagers 1 and 2, uh, the Galileo probe to Jupiter, the Cassini-Huygens probe to Saturn, the New Horizons probe out to Pluto. They've all gone through the asteroid belt. None of them has ever been hit by an asteroid. The asteroid belt is not like that scene from, uh, is it Empire Strikes Back? Empire Strikes Back where the Millennium Falcon has to dodge all the asteroids because space is just filled with these rocks. The asteroids in the asteroid belt are hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles apart from one another. There's plenty of room to fly through the asteroid belt. Space is big and asteroids are small. So uh, despite the fact that there's lots of them, the spaces between them are enormous. There's very little chance of being hit by an asteroid if you point a space probe at Jupiter's orbit and try to fly it from here to Jupiter. So um, these give you a little bit of a, uh, an unrealistic view of what the asteroid belt looks like. There are also asteroids that orbit in Jupiter's orbit or near Jupiter's orbit. There are a group of asteroids that orbit a little bit behind Jupiter in its orbit, and there are a group of asteroids that orbit a little bit in front of Jupiter 
in its orbit. These are at special points called the Lagrange points in the orbit where the force of the sun on these asteroids and the force of Jupiter on these asteroids kind of cancel each other out. And so the asteroids move around at that same point in Jupiter's orbit. There. Um, I don't remember there's the Lagrange, there's five Lagrange points. There's L1, L2, L3, A4. I think this is L3 and four. And then there's another one over here um, where the, at the point where um, Jupiter's gravity and the sun's gravity are pulling these asteroids in the same direction. So they orbit a little bit inside of Jupiter's orbit because the gravitational pull in them is a little stronger. Um, so there are literally hundreds of thousands of asteroids whose orbit we know and have tracked over time um, and know the orbits of these asteroids quite accurately. It's worth noting that if we took all the asteroids in the asteroid belt and took a big giant spaceship out there and scooped them all up together and squished them into an object, the total mass of that object would only be 4% the mass of the moon or about a quarter of the mass of Pluto, somewhere in between the, the mass of Charon and the mass of Pluto. So that's not a lot of stuff when taken all together. It is the size of a smallish moon, which kind of supports the theory that what was happening at that point around the sun five billion years ago is a planet was forming maybe several planets were forming and those planets crashed together and broke all that stuff back up again. And then just never didn't have enough gravitational oomph to clump itself back together. Um, asteroids can be, uh, well, most asteroids are not big enough for gravity to pull them into a sphere. Remember, we've said a couple of times now that um, the reason that big planets are round is because gravity is pulling them in in all directions. But uh, a rock that's only a couple of kilometers long, this, uh, the asteroid Eros is about the size of the island of Manhattan, about the size of New York City. Uh, there's not enough gravitational pull to squish that into a round sphere. So it has this kind of elongated, um, irregular shape. Um, here is an asteroid called Gaspra. Again, we can see this kind of elongated, irregular shape. It's not big enough for um, gravity to squish it into a sphere. Here's an asteroid called Ida, which actually has another asteroid called Dactyl, which orbits it like a little tiny moon. So asteroids have mass, they exert gravitational pulls on one another, just like the moon orbits the earth or Titan orbits Saturn. Okay, an asteroid can have a little asteroid moon that orbits around it. Um, this is a, just a diagram showing the sizes of the 10 largest asteroids in comparison to our moon. The largest by far is uh, Ceres, and uh, asteroids are generally given numbers that, uh, or the largest asteroids are given numbers that indicate the order in which they were discovered. So the, the first asteroid discovered is called one Ceres. The second one is called two Vesta, three, I don't remember the, three is Juno. Oh, I was wrong. Two Pallas, three Juno, four Vesta, five Astraea. Okay, so these are the, the 10 largest asteroids and they're also the first 10 asteroids discovered. It kind of makes sense that the first asteroids we discovered were the biggest asteroids because they're the ones that show up most easily in the telescope. By the way, what does the word asteroid mean? It's one of these words in astronomy that has a confusing history based on the fact that when we first saw it, we didn't know what it was. Aster oid means star-like, like an asterisk, the little uh, symbol on top of the eight on your keyboard. It's like a little star, right? Um, the reason asteroids are called star-like is when you look at them on a photograph from, um, say, the turn of the 20th century, they look like a little dot, like a little star. So they look star-like on your photograph. But what you'll see is if you take a picture the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day is they move relative to the stars like a planet does. So these things were thought to be like stars when they showed up in photographs, but we eventually figured out they're more like planets because they orbit around the sun. Here is uh, the largest asteroid in our solar system, Ceres, shown next to the Earth and the moon to give you some kind of sense of scale. It's pretty big. Uh, we wouldn't want to get hit by it. Um, but it's much, much smaller than the moon. And that's the biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Uh, it was discovered in 1801. 
by an astronomer named uh, Piazzi. And it was originally, we were going to just call it a planet. Um, so in an alternate universe, uh, there might have been a universe where the planets in the solar system were Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Ceres, Jupiter, Saturn. But after we started discovering a bunch of other ones in a similar location in the solar system, we finally realized, and eh, these things are maybe not planets. They're kind of too small. Uh, and there's a bunch of them. We don't want there to be so many planets. So we gave them their own name. We call them asteroids. And we reclassify them as a different kind of object. It's worth noting that Ceres by itself is one third of the mass of the asteroid belt. So all those little dots I showed you um, orbiting the sun between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, if you scraped them all together, um, you'd have Ceres and then the other stuff would be about twice as big as Ceres. Um, so Ceres by itself is a large fraction of the, um, of the mass of the asteroid belt. Here is a graphic just showing Ceres' orbit. A couple of things to notice. One is that the orbit of Ceres is much more elliptical than the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which are pretty close to round. We talked about the fact that all orbits are slightly elliptical, but the orbits of the planets are pretty close to round. Ceres is a little more distorted, a little more, uh, the word that you use is eccentric, um, a little more elliptical than the orbits of, um, say, Mars and the Earth. And the other thing to notice in this lower photograph is that the orbit of Ceres is tilted quite a bit from the plane that most of the planets orbit in. The orbital inclination is 10 degrees. So Ceres' orbit is um, not the same as the planet orbits, which is one of the reasons we don't call it a planet. We actually uh, did not explore any asteroids up close until just a few years ago. This is a photograph taken by the Dawn spacecraft, which uh, did a flyby and I think orbit of um, Ceres back in 2015. Uh, and you can see when you look at Ceres that it is pretty round. It's almost uh, big enough for gravity to have squished all the tall bumps down into a perfect sphere. Um, like I said, in an alternate universe, we might call Ceres a planet because it is round and it does orbit the sun. The one characteristic, when we're talking about Pluto, I said um, astronomers are trying to come up with like a dividing line. What do you call a planet? What do you not call a planet? And one of the criteria was it's big enough to be round. Okay, well, Ceres is kind of there. One of the other crit criteria was it has mostly cleared its orbit of other debris. Well, that's clearly not the case for Ceres, right? Ceres orbits in the middle of the asteroid belt with all that other junk. So that's why Ceres is nowadays called by some a dwarf planet. So you can either think of Ceres as one or two things. Either Ceres is the biggest asteroid or the Ceres is the smallest dwarf planet in the inner solar system. Um, again, you can see that Ceres, like the moon, is covered in craters which means asteroids get hit by other asteroids. Uh, these objects are always banging into each other in the solar system. Um, but we also saw some things that we didn't expect when we orbited um, Ceres and took photographs. This is one example of what looks like a volcano. Now, probably not like a magma volcano like we have here on the Earth, probably something more like the cryo volcanoes that we see out on Triton, um, Charon, uh, maybe Ganymede, um, and so on. But this would have to mean that there would be something molten underneath the surface of Ceres. Now, this doesn't look active. This looks like the, uh, the top of that has solidified, so there's no more stuff coming out of it. But it looks like in the past, this was created uh, just like volcanoes on Earth were created. It's surprising that an object as small as Ceres would have an active interior in the recent past, but it looks like it might have. Here's another view showing um, the top of this volcanic cone, which has craters on it, so we know it's relatively old, right? It's had time for stuff to bang into it. So a dormant cryovolcano, but maybe a cryovolcano nonetheless. The other thing we see on Ceres that was maybe unexpected are 
I don't know, probably would have been unexpected 20 years ago, maybe not five years ago, is organic material. These tholins that we see in the outer solar system, which have this kind of reddish, orange, brown uh, color, like a stain on the surface that we believe are caused when ultraviolet light hits things like methane and carbon dioxide, causes them to form these simple short chains of, uh, of carbon atoms, simple organic molecules. We see these, I think this is a slightly color enhanced photograph, but we do see these red stains on the surface of Ceres as well. Okay, so that's all I'll say about comets. I'll put up a, a crash course video about, sorry, that's all I'll say about asteroids. I'll put up a crash course video about asteroids, maybe an asteroid video about what we discovered about Ceres um, to kind of um, supplement this first half of what I'm gonna talk about today. Second half of what I wanna talk about today is talk about comets. Comets and asteroids are similar in that they are kind of small leftover junk that orbits the sun. Asteroids are largely confined to the region between Mars and Jupiter. Comets often go way, way further out into the solar system. And what's the main difference between comets and asteroids is their composition. Comets are, um, asteroids are largely rocky or metallic and comets are largely icy. And the other feature that we associate with comets visually is their tail. Here's a photograph of a comet taken in the sky of the Earth. Um, here's another comet. I think this is maybe Hale Bop. I should have these labeled which comet is which. Um, and when we look at a comet, we see a bright head or nucleus and a long tail that uh, emerges from the back of the comet. The thing to realize about comets is they don't zoom across the sky like a meteor. Like if you go outside and see a comet, what does that look like? It's a little fuzzy dot up in the sky with a long tail that stays there all night and it rises and sets over the course of the night, just like the stars and the planets rise and set over the course of the night as the earth spins. And then the next night, the comet will be in a slightly different place, just like the planets are in a slightly different place every night and it'll rise and set over the course of the night. And the next night, it'll be in a slightly different place. So comets move through the sky like a planet over the course of several nights. They don't zip across the sky like a meteor. And comets are not a feature that happens in our atmosphere. There's something that happens well outside of our atmosphere, okay? I think this is hail bop. One of the things that is really distinct about some comets is their tail is kind of split. One of these tails is largely gases and the other one of these tails is largely ices. Um, so uh, a comet can have a gas tail and an ice tail that are separate from one another and point in slightly different directions. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. Here's a picture of that actually, I think that same comet taken a long exposure photograph of the night sky, probably somewhere like New Mexico out in the desert. You can see that all the stars are little lines. Um, that's because the way this photograph is taken is a camera is pointed at the sky and instead of just going click and taking a camera photo that lasts a quarter of a second or a half a second, um, the shutter is left open for several seconds. This looks like maybe a 30 second exposure. So for 30 seconds, this camera is slowly piling up light from the stars, but the stars move a little bit during that 30 seconds. So all the images are blurred, um, including the image of the comet, but that's a way, that's how you take pictures of dim objects in space is instead of taking a, just a quick fraction of a second exposure, you take an exposure that lasts several minutes or even several hours. Um, usually you put your camera on a telescope that moves to track the stars. It spins every 24 hours, just like the earth spins every 24 hours. This was just taken on a regular tripod. Okay, another pretty picture of a comet with this kind of wispy, you can see um, the shape of the tail. Uh, looks like it's being blown um, like smoke in our atmosphere, right? If you put a candle next to a fan, uh, you would get something that looks not too terribly different from this. And the tail of a comet is being blown, not by the wind of any atmosphere, but by the thing we call the solar wind. The first thing that we should know about comets is that their orbits often take them from the outskirts of the solar system out where Jupiter and Saturn are, maybe even out to where Uranus and Neptune are, and come back into the inner solar system in an orbit that is highly elliptical. And comet orbits tend to be very eccentric and can have an orbit that goes out as far as Jupiter and Saturn at one end, and as close as the Earth or Mercury and Venus and the close end. 
Comets are orbiting the sun this whole time, but they do not have a tail this whole time. I said that comets are largely icy, which means when they're out around Jupiter and Saturn, the material that they're made out of, the ices that they are made out of, is perfectly happy to be a solid because it's not getting much light from the sun. Remember, out where Jupiter is, it's 250 below zero Fahrenheit. Out where Saturn is, it's 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But as this object comes into the inner solar system, and gets hotter and hotter and hotter and receives more and more and more sunlight, the ices that make up that body start to evaporate. Usually not from solid to liquid because there's no air pressure, usually straight from solid to gas. It's called sublimating, right? When something turns from solid to a gas like dry ice does. So as a comet approaches the sun, the material that makes up the comet starts to sublimate into a gas. And that gas is blown by the solar wind away from the comet, which gives the appearance of a tail that points in the direction of the solar wind. So as a comet is approaching the inner solar system, its tail points behind it. As it orbits around the sun, its tail points away from the sun. That's when the comet is most visible to us here on Earth because its tail is the longest, because it is hotter and the solar wind is blowing back that tail more strongly, and so it's reflecting more light. And then as it swings by the other side of the sun, the tail is actually pointing in the direction that it's moving, right? So the tail isn't always behind the comet. When we think of, when we, when we look at a comet and we see its tail pointing away behind it, it's hard not to imagine it's always moving this way with the tail traveling behind it, right? Because what we're picturing like, uh, you know, you're just running, holding a, a streamer or something, the streamer will be blown behind it. But when a comet is leaving the inner solar system, it's actually moving with its tail in front of it because the tail is pointing in the direction that the solar wind is blowing, not the direction that the comet is necessarily moving. And as it moves into the outer solar system, that tail fades and fades and fades and gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until we can't see it anymore. Um, Hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, we would every once in a while see a comet. They come into the inner solar system, they get bright, you see this thing appear in the sky, it has a long tail, and then it goes away again for good, as far as we knew. That was weird. If you are a culture that pays attention to the sky, which we talked in the first week of class, we talked about the fact that Ancient cultures paid attention to the sky because they had to know, for example, when the seasons change and stuff like that. That's why every, every civilization on Earth had some sort of uh, at least vague culture of looking at the sky and measuring time according to the moon and the constellations and the seasons. What happens when something shows up in the sky that's never been there before and then just goes away again? It freaked people out. Um, for thousands of years, comets were seen as bad omens, uh, either of the type that, uh, you know, the gods are angry because we did something bad or the type that this is a premonition of something bad that's going to happen on the earth. Um, they were scary because things in the sky were always so regular, right? The constellations do their thing every year and the planets do their thing every several years. Comets were seen to be unpredictable, and that was frightening to people. Until in the 1600s, a guy named Edmund Halley figured out, hey, wait a minute. If we look back through history every 70-some years, like they saw a comet this year, and then 70-some years before that, they saw a comet, and then 70-some years before that, they saw another comet. I bet that's the same comet just coming by over and over again in an orbit just like the planet's. By the way, in mid-1600s, we had just figured out that the planets orbit the sun anyway, right? The reason that if you've heard the name of any comet, the comet you've heard of is Halley's Comet, is because Halley was the first person to figure out that comets were not just one-off things that happened in the sky. They were objects that orbited the sun, and we only see them when they get close to the sun, for whatever reason. Certainly, Halley couldn't have guessed that they were made of ices and they... Uh, that there was a solar wind. I mean, that, that, that explanation didn't happen until probably the 20th century or maybe late, late 18th century. 
But the idea that a comet is just an object that orbits the sun is something we didn't figure out until the scientific revolution, kind of between uh, the times of Galileo, early 1600s, Newton, late 1600s. In the 20th century, 1980s, we actually flew a spacecraft past Halley's Comet. Uh, I always forget the dates of this, and I shouldn't because I was alive then and I saw Halley's Comet. Um, 85, 86 was the last appearance of Halley's Comet in um, the night sky of the Earth, close to the inner solar system, um, close enough that we could see it. Um, how... Halley's Comet is not the brightest comet that shows up in our sky. Um, it's not famous because it's bright. It's famous because Edmund Halley predicted that it would come back again. Um, so some years you'll get a good Halley's Comet um, that will be far, far enough from the sun and high enough in our sky that we can get a good view of it. Um, the appearance in the 80s wasn't super great. Um, I saw it, but I needed a telescope to see it. I really couldn't see much of a tail. It was just kind of a little fuzzy blob. The tail was very dim. So eh, it wasn't super exciting. Halley's Comet will be back again. Its orbit is 75, 76 years. So it'll be back again in 2061. Um, so any of you who, uh, well, all of you will probably be here to see Halley's Comet in 2061. Um, will I be here in 2061 to see Halley's Comet? Maybe. I better start eating better if I want to see 2061. Uh, I won't do the math now and figure out how old I'm going to be here. But I was 13 or so, 13, 14, 15? 15, 16, the first time Halley's Comet came by, which would put me at close to 90 the next time it comes by. So I got a shot. We'll see. Um, but this is what Halley's Comet looked up up close. We sent a spacecraft called Giotto to fly through the, the material that's being evaporated from Halley's Comet and to take pictures of it. Obviously, the pictures aren't great. They're not super clear, first of all, because it's a digital camera from the mid-1980s. Second of all, because you're flying through this cloud of stuff evaporating off a comet. But what we can see is the nucleus of Halley's Comet. If I ask you, looking at this picture, which direction is the sun? Okay, which direction would I point in this picture to see the sun? Okay, well, one side of the comet is dark and the other side is bright. And you can see on the bright side, this material just evaporating is kind of exploding off the surface of the comet because that's the side being heated by the sun. So the sun here would be on the lower right-hand side of the picture, far away, but heating that side of the comet. So it evaporates or sublimates from the icy state to the gaseous state. And then that material is blown back in this direction. Well, I can't do that. The camera is flipping my, uh, my image. Blown to the upper left of the image here um, to create the tail of the comet. The description of comets that was uh, made popular in the press around the time of Halley's Comet, uh, its flyby in the 1980s, is to think of it as like a dirty snowball. You go out in a dirt and gravel driveway when it snows six inches or so, and you make a snowball in that driveway, it'll be ice, it'll be rocks, it'll be dust and dirt all kind of packed together. Okay, so that's the one way to think about the composition of um, a comet, a mixture of rock and ice, which means that every time a comet comes by the inner solar system, some of it evaporates, little bits of rock fall off of it, some of the ice gets blown off by this solar wind. So comets that visit the inner solar system are temporary. They're evaporating a little bit every time. They're getting a little smaller and a little lighter every time. Comets do sometimes run into stuff, just like asteroids and meteoroids sometimes run into stuff. There was a very, um, um, well, memorable, let's call it, event that happened in the um, 1990s. I could probably date this uh, fairly accurately from my own experience because I was, at the time this happened, um, a graduate student at William Mary and I was the TA, the teaching assistant for the astronomy classes. And one of the jobs of the TA was to run the observatory on top of the roof of a uh, small hall at uh, William and Mary. And um, one of the things that happened while I was doing this, so this probably would have been, let's see, I started grad school in 92. This would have probably been 94, 95-ish. 
I think the next slide gives the date, but I'm trying to piece it together from my own memory. What happened was a comet crashed into Jupiter. Uh, the comet was called Schumacher-Levy 9. Comets are named after the person who discovers it. Uh, so Schumacher-Levy 9 was the ninth comet discovered by Schumacher and Levy during that year. Schumacher-Levy 9 was on a crash course to Jupiter. As soon after it was discovered, we computed its orbit and we're like, hey, this thing's going to crash into Jupiter. As it approached Jupiter, the tidal forces of Jupiter's gravity pulled it apart. Remember, a tidal force is when gravity pulls harder on one side than the other. So Jupiter's gravity pulled this comet apart into a long line of comet chunks. And this is a photograph of Schumacher Levy 9 taken just before it crashed into Jupiter. And those chunks hit the atmosphere one at a time. Remember, Jupiter spins pretty fast, about 10 hours or so. So every impact happened at a slightly little different place in the atmosphere. And what you got were these impacts in the atmosphere, bang, 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 these dark depressions in the atmosphere that then rotated around. Um, so you could see them uh, get gradually fade over the next couple of rotations. And I could see this with the 14 inch telescope that was on the roof of Small Hall at William & Mary, which is now in my lab upstairs. I told you guys the story about how I, um, I tricked them into giving me the old telescope. So um, this is something you could see in a small telescope. You could see these little black dots appear in the orbit of, or the atmosphere of, of um, Jupiter and then rotate around. Obviously Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface. So these weren't permanent, right? All that happened is the comet chunks kind of punched through the atmosphere, made a little dent. That's why it looks dark because it's like a shadow, um, almost like a crater in the atmosphere, but it's, it's temporary. So the gas eventually filled it in again and they only last like a couple of rotations as it went around. Here's a picture showing, uh, there you can see the impact. This, what's a time, it's several pictures, right? Taken at different times. So the first one is you can just see the impact happening over the edge. And then as Jupiter rotates, you see that impact rotates into view and then the next impact rotates into view and they gradually kind of fade over time as the gas just swirls back in and fills them out. So, but it was one of the first times we had actually seen with modern technology, a comet actually crashing into something, which was kind of super cool. And it was cool to see um, with your own eyeballs looking through a telescope, not just some picture from NASA. Um, there is a relationship, a connection between comets and meteor showers. Um, and I'm trying to be mindful of time here. We're at about 37 minutes. Um, you might have heard, you might have seen on the news, oh, this weekend on Saturday night, there's going to be a meteor shower. Or next, you know, August 15th, there's going to be a meteor shower, the Perseids, and you can go out and see it. And you may have wondered, how do we know that there's going to be a meteor shower? And what is a meteor shower? A meteor shower happens when the Earth crashes into a bunch of little bits of cosmic junk all at once, little meteoroids. Most of the things you're seeing in a meteor shower are things the size of a grain of sand or a piece of gravel on your driveway. They're not big. Every once in a while, they might be the size of a brick. Uh, very rarely, they'll be the size of a cinder block. Most of them are just like tiny little rocks, things the size of a refrigerator ice cube hitting the Earth's atmosphere all in the same day. And you can go outside during a meteor shower and you can look up and look in the direction that the Earth happens to be moving. And you can see about one of these a minute, a typical meteor showers, about 50, 60 an hour. And it'll just be a little flash of light. Okay. Why does this happen in a predictable way? It happens in a predictable way because comets, as they evaporate in the inner solar system, leave behind a trail of junk that has been evaporated and broken off the comet. So the orbit of a comet, a comet that comes into the inner solar system, is filled with debris that's been blown off the comet. And that debris stays in that orbit and it keeps orbiting around the sun. So if the orbit of a comet crosses the Earth's orbit, which many of them do, every time the Earth goes around the sun, it'll go through that comet's orbit, which is filled with junk which is why every August 15th, there's a meteor shower called the Perseids when the Earth passes through the tail of some particular comet. Every March, whatever, there's a meteor shower called the Leonids, which happens um, when the Earth passes through the tail of the comet. So what we see as the Earth is moving into this debris of the comet tail, we see, it's like, um, like when you're driving in the snow, uh, it looks like the snow is all coming from a vanishing point, right? Um, or if you look up, 
when it's uh, snowing or raining, it looks like uh, there's a vanishing point that all those snowflakes or raindrops are coming from. Um, meteor showers are named after the constellation that the Earth happens to be moving towards when uh, this meteor shower happens. So the Perseids happen when the Earth is moving towards the constellation of Perseus, happens to be passing through um, this junk left over from a comet, and all the meteors look like they're coming from that point in space that's the direction of the constellation Perseus. The Leonids happen at some other time of the year when we're moving in a different direction. So all those asteroids are coming from a vanishing point that's in some other constellation. So the, the meteor shower has nothing to do with the constellation. That's just the direction we happen to be moving when we encounter this junk in the orbit of a comet. Okay, are we done? Oh, there's a, there's a slide here that, uh, Gosh, it's not in the, the presentation that I want to talk about. I wonder if I can really quickly um, find this thing that I want to. Well, you know what? We're at 40 minutes now. Why don't I do this? We got one more lecture day this week, right? Thursday. So why don't I stop here? We'll talk about um, the idea of comets and asteroids crashing into planets and what would happen if that happened on the Thursday lecture. And then on Friday, we'll do the lab. Uh, and the lab is about what would happen if comets or asteroids of different sizes crashed into the Earth. Um, and so that'll finish off this week nicely. We'll be done with the stuff that orbits the sun. And then next week on Monday, we can start talking about the sun. Just a very, very simple introduction to the sun. Um, and Monday or Tuesday will be the last thing. Oh, wait a minute. Next Monday and Tuesday are vacation days, aren't they? Now, this is an online class, right? So do you guys get a vacation day? Um, well, if you don't get a vacation day, I don't get a vacation day because I got to record a lecture. So I guess what that means is what I'll probably do next Monday or Tuesday, or I'll probably do this in advance, is post a couple of review videos, not videos made by me, some Astrum videos, some Crash Course videos, some cool PBS. I haven't used the PBS science videos much today. Those are really good too. Um, maybe I'll post some of those over the weekend for you to maybe watch one or two on Monday or Tuesday, but we'll consider Monday and Tuesday to be mostly days off. Okay. And I'm pretty sure I said that our midterm exam was going to be a week from this Friday, right? Which means that this Friday I should give you a review sheet for what's going to be on the midterm. It also means that we probably won't get to the sun before the midterm, which would mean that the midterm will cover everything up until basically what we do this Friday, okay? Um, usually I barely get to the sun when we get to the midterm and I put a couple of questions about the sun on the midterm, but because our fall break is a little longer this year than it was pre-COVID, I don't think that's gonna work. So um, midterm will cover up until this Friday. Um, I will give you, or I will post to Canvas, uh, a sample midterm on Friday, um, a couple of review questions over fall break. Um, we'll start a new topic. We'll start talking about the sun next Wednesday and Thursday, but that material will not be covered on the midterm exam. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, yeah, so um, tomorrow, asteroid and comet impacts. Friday, asteroid and comet lab.